Good morning, everybody. We have with us Dr. Muthu Krishna Sarvanand Kumar. He is an eminent development economist by profession and the founder, come principal researcher of the Point Pedro Institute of Development, Sri Lanka. Sir, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I have a string of questions sure, in relation you. to this conference that we are having. So, my first question is. What are the barriers in economic and labor force participation by women in the post-civil war in northern province of Sri Lanka? And how do you compare these barriers in, uh, as prevalent in India? Are they similar in nature okay. or are they distinct? Okay. It's, it's not only in comparison to Sri Lanka, but I would say also in comparison to other parts of Sri Lanka from the areas of the conflict. Uh, yeah, there are you know, there are some very general barriers to women uh, in any country, in any, under any culture, uh, in terms of um, employers uh, tend to pay lower wages mm -hmm. and they may not offer them all the um, jobs which they uh, traditionally perhaps uh, would um, prefer men to work. Uh, the, the very common uh, discrimination which uh, takes place uh, across the world, basically, developed countries, developing countries. But in terms of Sri Lanka's post-conflict, uh, former conflict-ridden area, there are specific barriers for women to um, enter the labor force. Um, as you know, the Sri Lanka has one of the lowest uh, labor force parts, as Sri Lanka as a whole has uh, one of the lowest uh, labor force participation rate uh, in South Asia. Within uh, Sri Lanka, there are nine provinces in Sri Lanka and two former conflict affected provinces, that is Eastern and Northern provinces, have the uh, lowest for women's uh, labor force participation. The, some of the findings, what we found is some of the barriers are uh, directly as a result of the conflict itself. Uh, for example, uh, for a long time, uh, the educational levels were disrupted, uh, skills levels of uh, females uh, mm -hmm. as well as males, but most so of the females. Because of the insecurity, uh, women tended to remain indoors as much as possible okay. because of the general overall security issues. Uh, parents would not allow them. So naturally, because the conflict has been going on for 26 years, mm -hmm. so it's long time, so long time idle labor, lower skill levels, so they were not prepared. Soon after the end of the war, they were not fully equipped or prepared to enter the labor market at a level playing field, I would say. Mm -hmm compared to the rest of uh, the Sri Lankan women in other parts of Sri Lanka or compared to India. So there's, there was those natural barriers like, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of skills and all, they were lagging behind uh, the women of uh, other parts of Sri Lanka as well as uh, women of India or, or other countries. And then um, there were uh, other socio-cultural barriers, some, some of them and also, there were a lot of uh, violence against women uh, from the armed forces. That happens uh, in civil wars. In also. civil war zones, um, I'm sure in uh, India as well, in Kashmir, places like Kashmir. Yeah. So that is an additional burden or additional security precautions women have to take. Right. And also, the geography of the conflict region itself was an impediment for women to enter the labor force after the end of the war, especially the northern province. There are five districts in the northern province, uh, but only in one district, uh, about 55% of the entire northern provincial population lives in one district. So that's a highly densely populated uh, area. Um, so it's, uh, so in, in terms of security, it is more secure, but there are other four other districts where there's, the population is very dispersed, sparsely population, and also there are jungle areas. Oh. So the lack of transport, lack of uh, proper roads for them to go from interior parts of those areas to the workplaces, whether in semi-urban areas or near the highways and all that. So the lack of transport and all put them off. Even school children have to go by bicycles, uh, dry, uh, ride for about two, three kilometers, four kilometers every day, back and forth to uh, attend school. So there are also issues of uh, dropping uh, children, dropping out of school. So obviously, boys 
would less drop out the, if there's a choice families or parents have to make they would uh, choose the girls to remain at home uh, compared to uh, so there were these kind of special um, barriers uh, in a post conflict zone which normally you find in many other places but there were some factors and also uh, the employer, the mentality, the attitude of the employers towards uh, female employees. I mean, that's a very gender phenomenon, yeah. whether it's post-conflict or otherwise. So th these also have to be faced by these uh, women in the post-conflict situation. But then there are addition to these um, uh, barriers from outside the community or uh, from outside their geographical regions. There are certain barriers imposed by the community themselves or the family themselves, um, mainly cultural barriers. So one of the reasons I would explain why the labor force participation uh, rate is lowest in the northern and eastern province compared to the rest of Sri Lanka is these are the two provinces where minority communities uh, are the majority in, in their respective uh, provinces. Say so for example, northern province, Tamil, Hindu population is the single largest ethnic group. Whereas in the East, it's actually uh, the Hindu, the Tamil Hindu and the Muslim population. In Sri Lanka, the Muslims speak Tamil language, but they would uh, identify themselves as Muslims, right. not as Tamils, so uh, based on the religion, so mm -hmm. that's all. So the Eastern province, the Tamil Hindu and the Muslim population uh, are almost equal proportional, about 40-40%. So, as you know, the Muslim population also has very uh, conservative uh, practice, uh, cultural practices whereby, especially for women, uh, girls, uh, parents would not allow. So, they, they, so that's one of the reasons why perhaps I would explain the northern East, eastern provinces, the labor force, uh, the females' labor force participation is lowest. And then uh, there are also, uh, um, occupational stereotypes, certain jobs which uh, are historically allocated for men and women. So if women try to tend to uh, break into some vocation which are traditionally uh, occupied by men, there may be opposition from within mm -hmm. the family. Although girls or women themselves may be prepared to do those jobs, but within the family or if not within the family, at least within the workplace. Uh, also yeah, workplace also they may face, but also within the community itself. Community, yeah. So, for example, one example is like uh, there's an NGO which wanted to promote um, female uh, three-wheel taxi drivers, mm. tuk-tuk drivers, yeah. and they uh, provided they chose ten women and uh, provided uh, with the three-wheel to run the taxi service so that women passengers could feel safer, Safe. especially at night time. Or, uh, and, but uh, at the end of the first year, there was only one woman who, uh, who, who, who was uh, continuing with that uh, profession okay. because others. Of course, we couldn't find the exact reason why, because they would not tell openly, but indirectly we found out that one is that perhaps there was not much uh, demand for uh, taxi service. Perhaps the general uh, attitude of the population is uh, women are l less not supposed uh, to not, not supposed to they are uh, less proficient in driving or safe. oh, yeah. they are not so safer to drive. I, I face it all the time okay. by driving. Yeah, exactly. So the, that perception is very much yeah. ingrained. That it's a male dominant uh, yeah, thing to drive. So they would be, whether male or female passenger, they may be a bit fearful to Woman uh, to uh, hire, a, hire a woman <laughs> drive the three wheeler, uh, but then there are also other yeah. Uh, when women drive, then yeah, it is a competition for um, men. Uh, they made the, some of the derogatory remarks or so, mm, uh, kind of things. Uh, yeah, it also puts them off, puts the female drivers off. Yeah. Uh, so gradually they pull back, and perhaps family also then feels that uh, perhaps uh, it's not the uh, right uh, job for my daughter. So yeah. there are a lot of pressures. Um, so, so, the, so the barriers are both uh, quite general with any other community and there are specific um, barriers based on a post-conflict situation, but then there are barriers within the household, within the community itself. Right. So it's multifaceted. Yeah. 
so sir my second question is with respect to the organized and the unorganized sector of workers that yeah. we have so all the legislations or i should say most of the legislations yeah, sure. they cover the organized sure. sector they yeah. protect their rights yeah. and promote their rights yeah. so these diverse and small unorganized sector workers sure. are left helpless yeah so in case of any violation yeah, or exactly. in case case of any trouble they don't sure. get any aid yeah, sure. so in these cases what should be done should there be a proper leg- and separate legislation for them if yes then they are so small in number and they are so diverse how do we cover them in one legislation or how yeah they are not small i would say the informal sector at least in sri lankan case informal labor is much higher than the formal labor but they are so diverse yeah like of course they are diverse one industry is sure. small uh, sure. then another is another yeah, small sure. that that's what i mean yeah okay from an economic point of view i would say uh, yeah that's a major drawback of labor legislations because that protects the formal laborers right. uh, uh, or registered laborers whereas uh, a lot of the laborers in many developing countries mm-hmm. uh, whether in sri lanka india or any other countries um, sort of uh, unregistered or informal mm-hmm. so they are of course not covered by the legislation uh, the prot- social protection of the labor rights or other um, equal pay or whatever kind of thing uh, i would say my best solution there can't be a special i think it's very difficult i don't know i'm not a legal professional but it's you can't have a spe- special or separate legislation to cover the informal sector because even to apply that Uh, special legislation you have to be registered you have, the state or the regulatory body should know who are these informal or where are they working you know how are they working, how are they working? so obviously they there is a lot of resistance from this info, from my experience in sri lanka is that there a lot of re, uh, resistance from the uh, this informal workers themselves for them to register because uh, although there are pros and cons of this registration on becoming formal labor is that because if they formally register of course they will be protected in terms of exploitation or other kind of but then uh, they become the, accountable to the exactly group. then yes. they become um, formal then they have to pay their uh, uh, the, what we call uh, employee employee uh, provident fund employee yes. trust fund contributions so basically that their take home pay may be lesser than what they would Uh, get otherwise, uh, yeah, otherwise yes. yeah uh so to avoid uh, paying uh, taxes and kind of thing uh, and also uh, perhaps uh, they also don't want to yeah in order to avoid income tax and various other thing they also perhaps prefer uh, not to be registered interfered with uh, maybe yeah and also perhaps they feel that it gives them some independence in terms of mm. um severing of relationship in case okay if you feel that you don't want to work tomorrow you can simply stop stay back. if you are a, if you are a formal employer you have to give a, a time limit one month or notice to the employer if you want to leave a job so somewhat uh, for being becoming formal restricts your freedom mm-hmm. to choose uh, to stop working from a particular job uh, the next day itself so i would say from an economic perspective i would argue that the state or the authorities should uh, encourage formalization of this uh, irregular informal sector generally and informal labor of course informal sector is there should be incentives for them as i said there are positive and negative things of becoming whether you are whether you're operating a informal business or in, informal self employment or whether you are a uh, informal worker whatever it is so there are benefits and advantages and disadvantages so obviously the government or the uh, uh, regulatory authorities should ensure that the um, the be- disincentive for people to become formalized mm. uh, in terms of uh, job or whatever has uh, so you have to provide sufficient incentives for them to uh, get uh registered or enrolled so that uh, they could be covered by um, uh, social security measures by the state or other so it is easier said than done uh, yeah. said uh, done but Definitely. because uh, yeah there may be 
a lot of sometimes employers also prefer informal workers because they don't have to more convenient, convenient they cheaper don't have to cheaper worry. labor for example yes, exactly. and they don't have, have to also make uh, statutory contributions to the government uh, in especially in india sir the labor regulations are really stringent now yeah. they're really difficult to be handled by the employers they're more employee friendly no no this is what is happening the the more the labor regulation becomes stringent the greater is the informalization of labor you know this is a worldwide trend so uh, that also does not help be, be making the law too stringent also indirectly government is informalizing uh, the because labor. then the employers would look for employer informal look also yeah. employees also may think uh, It's easier this. So for example there are restrictions on um, um this house mates going to middle eastern countries to work right. Home, right these agencies Okay okay work. no there's a Sri Lankan bureau of foreign employment where they have to get registered and sometimes they provide a basic training on mm-hmm. whatever vocation but uh, then also that restricts them uh, in terms of uh, getting a lower pay you know mm-hmm. government may want the employee to pay a certain amount but maybe some women are uh willing to work for lesser pay because they want to get a job mm-hmm. so they are so desperate so they also sometimes avoid registering uh, with the, the government agency mm-hmm. for number so both sides um, have to be after the employer employee side uh, there are some hesitation in becoming formalized so, so the only option is i would suggest is the governments or the regulatory bodies could uh, incentivize incentivize the employees to become formal so my next question is that the civil war in sri lanka ended in 2009 right so uh, what was the condition of labor rights post the civil war as soon as it ended and has it improved over time like it's 2017 now yeah. so it's been almost 8 years okay so right sri lanka started liberalizing in its economy in 1977 so it's more open market economy Uh, private sector friendly uh, public policies uh, government policies but then of course in the conflict affected region of the northern east because of the conflict this kind of free market economy did not really uh, take root um, until the end of the war and also as you know the yeah conflicts are different armed groups are different uh, the way of operation of armed groups are different and we the um, liberation tigers at tamil nadu which was the predominant armed group uh, in the northern and eastern parts of sri lanka was very authoritarian mm-hmm. so they would not tolerate any dissent or opposition whether from the so called enemy enemy is uh, the sri lankan government or the sinhalese majority community or within their community itself right whether they are trade unionists uh, whether they are labor rights activists because for them uh, the freedom or cre- creation of the separate state was their only goal right uh, their argument always has been even in terms of gender female uh, women's rights and all when people raise issues about that their, their uh, usual refrain is that yeah uh, we are committed to equality of uh, men and women but uh, uh, establishing a separate state is uh, the priority so until then we have to sacrifice all other our democratic rights whether it's male female or anything so that's the uh, 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 general difference so a lot of the trade unions also was uh, disseminated uh, by the ltt both there were uh, the, for example trade unions labor unions came under pressure from both the uh, government security forces as well as from the rebel groups uh, predominantly ltt but there were other tamil armed groups as well uh because all for all of them uh, their agenda their goal was uh, the prime uh, priority um other things democratic norms uh, democratic rights and all were secondary or even below that so yeah there was no trade union even the labor department did not operate in those uh, northern and eastern provinces so there was no monitoring of labor standards in both places whether it's shops or the factories or wherever uh because of the overall security situation so employers took advantage of that obviously okay. uh, 
obviously a lot of employers were also affected. They lost their assets, uh, machinery, whatever. But then they took advantage of that. They had a free go. Uh, yeah. They could, they were they not accountable. Control. Yeah, nobody. Whatever wages they could uh, uh, pay because the government or there's no labor department to charge yeah. them or sue them. So they had a free hand. Um, now after 30 years, of course. Uh, last um, uh, almost um, nine years or eight and a half years since the end of the war, uh, the national level trade unions are trying to re-establish their branches in their okay. former conflict affected regions. And there are some international trade union federations also trying to fund and uh, promote uh, trade unionism and uh, basically creating awareness of the rights. I mean, a lot of the Women or men, uh, workers generally don't know what their rights are. Exactly mm -hmm. for a long time, they were out of this uh, whole uh, system. So they're trying to promote awareness, uh, to inculcate knowledge of the existing laws, what the recourses, uh, what compensation, or whatever they can get, and who they have to make a complaint to, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. But I have to confess that it has been very difficult, very mm -hmm. difficult for labor unions. Uh, workers themselves are. Uh, not much interested. We have done um, uh, three surveys uh, in the conflict affected region. There are, like, for example, the ready made garment industries for mm -hmm. export, uh, yeah. uh, like in India, Bangladesh. Uh, in Sri Lanka, in other parts of Sri Lanka, it was established, but Sri La in the north and east, it was not established. But after the end of the war, there are these export garment industries that are being set up. So there have been attempts to mobilize those girls, because predominantly the workers in those uh, garment factories are females, young girls um, below 30, the age of 35. So there have been attempts to mobilize them to form unions in order to uh, fight or um, canvas for their rights, basic mm -hmm. rights in terms of uh, working time or overtime or the right. basic salaries or mm -hmm. other facilities like um, sanitation, toilet facilities or um, other health and safety, but it has been very difficult. It's not because, not much because, of course there's one side is the employers are also not very much favorable of uh, establishing or re-establishing these trade unions in this former conflict affected region because they have had a free run for a long time. So they enjoy that freedom yeah. to exploit uh, yeah. as uh, much as possible. Yeah. But then from the Workers' side also, there is. I should admit that there's some a lot of hesitation because they have undergone so much of violence and um, uh, trauma due to the conflict. So now they also don't want to pick up new fights, so to speak. Yeah. You know, that's what the term they use. That they don't want to pick up uh, new fights, whether it's with the employer or with the government, uh, labor department, or authorities or whatever. They want a hassle-free life. Uh, in some senses, they are happy that at least they are, have opportunities to work in these garment factories, right. which is relatively, for from the workers' point of view, they seem it's a respectable job. Okay. We have also seen, for example, you know, we are a northern province, it's a coastal province, so okay. seafood industry is main, uh, yeah. one of the uh, fishing is, uh, so, and we, Sri Lanka exposed a lot of uh, high value seafood. Yeah. And I know there's a particular factory, uh, the blue crab factory, that basically you catch crab and clean it, uh, process it and uh, export it. There were women who were working for 40,000 rupees, Sri Lankan rupees per month, mm -hmm. who had left those jobs and joined the yeah. ready-made garment factories for just 20 or less than 20,000. Mm -hmm. Because they don't see the jobs, the difference in jobs in terms of only their salary. Of course. They are getting less than half the salary they used to get. It's there. respect. It respect, and you know the crab fish is smelly thing. But they used to. I know. I have seen this. It's export oriented company, so they provide gloves yes. and all. It's not that you do it yeah. with your own hand. But still, it's uh, it's a hand work, and it's dirty, smelly, and uh, and also in the community you don't perhaps get much, that much respect. Relatively, perhaps. A garment industry uh, worker gets a, a, a little bit better respect. Yeah. So because of that, uh, they are giving up this uh, forty thousand jobs and go on their own will. Nobody is forcing them. Mm -hmm. So there are instances of that. So this one particular example I say uh, gave is to show that it's not only that the employers are uh, reluctant to allow workers to 
collectivize and form unions and form their welfare societies to look after their welfare, but also from the employee side, at least so far, there is not much of enthusiasm. There's a little bit of enthusiasm, slowly, slowly growing, but perhaps it'll take 20, 30 years to, for the trade unionism and the collectivization of labor to uh, regain its uh, pre-Civil uh, War kind of situation. So my last question is with respect to equal pay for equal work. Yeah. So does that this policy or this norm holds as good in Sri Lanka as it does in India? Because do you all have uh, equal? Uh, yes, sir. Yes. It's, it's a fundamental right under Article Twenty One now. The Supreme Court has incorporated it. Okay. It has increased the ambit of Article Twenty One. And okay, it's good to know that because to be honest, I I, I didn't know although I studied in India, but you know, no, Sri Lanka, we don't have that legislation. Okay. That is one of the reasons I am now involved, although I am an economist, um, I am a member of the subcommittee on economic, social and cultural rights of the National Human Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. Now, as you know, there's a process of um, uh, writing a new constitution, so we are drafting a yes. new constitution for Sri Lanka. The first draft came out recently and uh, three, uh, this week, uh, three days, uh, there was a parliamentary debate on the first draft. Mm -hmm. We are trying to push this ESRC rights, economic, social and cultural rights, as justiciable rights. Right. There are a lot of opposition, of course. Uh, there are not much takers uh, within the political party, major political parties. Uh, there's a lot of opposition from the employers to incorporate. Um, so we are trying to push uh, ESRC, uh, also in terms of uh, equal pay for equal, equal work, kind of, in terms of gender discrimination, outlaw. We are not only pushing for this um, ESRC as a justice cyber right in the Constitution, but also we are, at least I am personally involved in arguing for a case for equal opportunities law, whereby right. Uh, discrimination based on ethnicity, gender, or even caste is outlawed, yeah. uh, becomes a criminal law, a criminal offense, so okay. that, that could be. Uh, I don't know how far we'll be successful, but we are trying. We are making some attempt to include. Uh, so far, to the best of my knowledge, we, Sri Lanka does not have a uh, equal um, pay for equal work uh, legislation. Um, so um, uh, generally, I know, to the best of my knowledge, women are paid less for the same uh, work. In, women are paid less in comparison to men for the same Exact same job in many, many uh, employment. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. It was an honor to have you. Okay, thank you very much thank for giving me this opportunity to talk about the post-conflict situation in Sri Lanka. Okay. Thank you.